Gracias a todos. Gracias. Oh. Thank you. One more. do a quick group photo with uh, this incredible band and then we're going to start the council meeting. So, uh, lady, gentlemen, please.
love it. I love it. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Christopher Ionella Chamber. My name is Matt O'Malley. I am the City Council President Pro Tempore. Today is Wednesday, August 6, 2021, and you are at the Boston City Council. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Bach. Councillor Braden. Present. Councillor Campbell. Present. Councillor Edwards. Here. Councillor Asabi George. Present. Councillor Flaherty. Here. Councillor Flynn. Here. Councillor Mejia. Councillor O'Malley. Here. And Councillor Wu. Present. Mr. President, all in attendance. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite Councillor Edwards to join me on the dais to introduce our clergy member, uh, Pastor David Searles uh, from Central Assembly of God Church. Pastor, if you'd like to join us up here as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to introduce Pastor David Searles from the Centri Central Assembly of God Church on Bennington Street in East Boston. It's actually right behind my house. This church has been dedicated to service and providing food and clothing for not only before the pandemic, but also only increase their services. Uh, to, I have been with David, or Pastor David, I should say, on many a peace walk in East Boston, uniting our community, uh, making sure that all of our community, our immigrant community, our longstanding community, all feel welcome and safe and feel that they're part of the solutions to help bring about a more united, beautiful East Boston. Uh, Pastor David has also uh, been in service with our new Recovery on the Harbor Recovery Center in East Boston, which has only grown to flourish to serve not only East Boston, but parts of Revere and Winthrop. And I have seen him in places of real pain, especially when the community lost Duncan two years ago to a shooting in, in Jeffrey's Point. And so to see him be there when there are a lot of tears, when there's a lot of pain, and celebrating our peace walks, but also serving in terms of giving food and continually empowering us to serve each other. It is really my honor to introduce Pastor David Sales for today's um, invocation. I want to say thank you to Councillor Edwards for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. I want to bow now in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we look to you to begin with our thanksgiving for the good that is being done in this great city. Though we face many challenges, we confront many issues, many that are discussed here in this very room, we want to stop and give thanks for the good that is already taking place. We thank you, God, for during this pandemic, an extraordinary season and time in our lives, that there was a great many people, agencies, the city of Boston, the federal government, rising up to meet the need, the great need that existed in our communities. We thank you, God, that we were able to eat our daily bread. We give thanks, oh God. We give thanks for a woman named Alice in our congregation who struggled in homelessness, who now is in a safe and good place, has her own room, and we give thanks, oh God. We thank you for a man named Joe who was struggling with addiction and homelessness and now is sober and in an apartment. Lord, we give thanks for these good gifts and they are a result of the good work going on. We give thanks. We also recognize our need and the challenges that are before us. We pray as Psalm 46 says to remember that you are a refuge and know how we need a refuge when we're facing great needs. We need a place of safety, O oh Lord, in our city and in our personal lives that you are our refuge and that you are our strength. We need strength to carry on when it seems as if there's no more energy to carry on, when we may feel hopeless in the midst of dealing with ongoing and persistent issues. Give us strength, O oh Lord, and to remember that you are an ever-present help in time of need. We pray that for this council meeting and these counselors who are here, to remember that you are present in our midst in the time of need to be our help, our strength, our refuge. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen and amen. 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 Just one sec. Uh, 
Thank you, Pastor, for those inspiring words. And uh, just before you go, uh, Councillor Edwards, if you'd like to, and Pastor, uh, for those who are able to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance uh, as Councillor Edwards leads us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again, uh, Pastor, and thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, it's always going to be a good me meeting if it can begin with music, and I again wanted to thank Mariachi on Boston for that incredible performance. Obviously, it is Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, and we are celebrating it now and every month as we should in the city of Boston. I did want to take this opportunity to, on behalf of Councillor Mejia and Councillor Arroyo, we are holding our uh, virtual Hispanic Heritage Month celebration, the city councils, on October 15th at noon. Uh, and as you know, each councillor will have two honorees to uh, represent their district uh, to be presented and recognized so majority of this event will be pre-recorded, although some of it will take place in here. But please, um, if you can send either Jessica Morris, my chief of staff, or Kerry Jordan, um, uh, by the end of this week, uh, the videos and, and the, the two uh, honorees from your district, that would be great. Uh, we have a number of uh, two presentations, actually. And I'd like to begin by inviting uh, Paralympian Chaz Davis, as well as his parents, Mark and Audrey, uh, his brother, Austin. Uh, David Brown, our dear friend, and Tom Grilk from the Boston Athletic Association to please join me on the dais. As some of you know, um, for my last 11 years in office, I, I've, uh, the Wednesday before Marathon Monday, which has always been in April, or Patriots Day, we've recognized some incredible marathon greats. We began with Jack Fultz, who was the winner in 1976, I believe, but Tom will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, of course, Joan Benoit Samuelson, the greatest of all time, in my opinion, as it relates to runners. Team Hoyt we had in this very chamber, which was a professional point of uh, just incredible pride for me. Uh, who, Des Linden, the, the last American woman to win it back several years ago. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can please join me right up here. Um, it, it just the list goes on and on, just some incredible athletes. Uh, and we are continuing that today by recognizing Chaz Davis. Um, before I present Chaz, uh, you with the resolution, join, join me right up here. I wanted to tell you all a little bit about Chaz. He's represented the United States and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the 2016 Rio Olymp Paralympic Games. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in criminal justice and psychology from the University of Hartford as, well as Hartford, as well as a master's degree in social work from the University of Denver. During his freshman year in college, he began experiencing loss of vision and was later diagnosed with labor hereditary optic neuropathy. In order to obtain a spot at the Rio Games, Chaz had to complete at the 2016 U.S. Paralympic Team Trials, where he earned a gold medal for the 1500 meter as well as the 5000 meter track and field events. Later that year, he ran his debut marathon at the United States Association for Blind Athletes, where he set a new American record for his division. To put in perspective, Chaz runs about a two and a half hour marathon. I'm typically at the halfway point of a marathon course at two and a half hours. Um, that's not self-effacing, that's absolutely the truth. Uh, in 2018, Chaz ran the 122nd Boston Marathon as part of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired charity group called Team with a Vision. And Team with a Vision is an international team of runners whose goal is to raise awareness and funding for rehabilitation services, support groups, and assistive technology for individuals who are experiencing loss of vision and blindness. And we're joined by our dear friend David Brown, uh, who's an executive with, T uh, with Mass Association for the Blind and just a dear friend to me. Um, David's husband, Ben, has also offered the invocation at my uh, invitation many times here on this. Uh, so it really is Old Homes Week with all my dear friends. Um, Chaz now works with the organization as an adjustment counselor and is the coordinator for Team with a Vision. So I'm honored today, Chaz, to present to you. He's going to run on Monday, and we are all will be rooting for him. He's also a constituent of Councilor Braden's district, and, and typically I'm in Councilor Braden's district. I'm cheering on the runners. And while Marathon Monday is going to be a big day, today is an equally auspicious occasion. Today, the City Council, all of us, have voted to declare October 6, 2021, as Chaz Davis Day in the City of Boston. Congratulations. We wish you all the best. We're so proud of you. We know you're going to do this. So I'm going to invite you to say a couple words and then perhaps uh, Tom Grilk. So Thank Jazz, you. the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm extremely grateful and honored to have this distinction. And I want to thank Council President O'Malley for today. And I also want to thank the Boston City Council for their continued support of Team with a Vision and the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And in 2014, when I began 
uh, when I really had this journey into legal blindness, I thought that my days of competing in running, my days of pursuing employment were over. And growing up watching the Boston Marathon as a child, standing at Heartbreak Hill and watching all the runners go by and the elite runners go by, I really wanted that to be me one day. And so in college, after I ended up losing my vision, I really set this goal to become the best athlete I could be, trying to figure out how I could do that, but then also wanting to pursue employment and be employed in the way that I wanted to as well. And so I'm just extremely grateful to have been given the opportunity to join Team with a Vision and the Mass Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, where I really can combine my two passions of working with people adjusting to vision loss and also helping people realize their dreams of competing in the Boston Marathon as people with visual impairments. And the Boston Athletic Association has just been tremendous with giving that opportunity and, and raising the bar for elite para-athletics. And I think this is just really only the start on Monday for what will be a really great experience for years to come. And so I just want to thank all of you today and uh, good day. Perfect. And before, before we take a photo, I wanted to invite Tom Grilk, Executive Director of the BAA, uh, for a couple words. We are wishing you so well on Monday, and we're just so grateful for your great partnership. So, Tom, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, you're doing a wonderful thing here this morning. It is very gratifying to see. If there's something particularly special about the Boston Marathon, it is that it brings people together in a whole lot of ways, whether they're running or watching or volunteering or just live around here. And we want to bring as many people as we can to it. And Chaz brings such excellence to this, along with other athletes known as para-athletes, the athletes who compete in the Paralympic Games. And this year, as Chaz was saying, for the first time at the Boston Marathon, above any other major marathon, we will have a series of competitive prize money para-divisions for visually impaired athletes, athletes with upper body impairments, lower body impairments, as well as uh, push rim wheelchair athletes. But right now, and a whole lot of Monday, is about Chaz. People like Chaz will often say when they are told that they are inspirational, but that's not what they're here to do. They're not out to inspire anybody. They're out to do the very best they can for themselves. And that's true, but the rest of us just can't help it. Uh, we watch them and we are inspired and think, can I do half so well as that at anything that I do? So uh, we at the BAA congratulate all of you for recognizing Chaz. It's a <laughs> wonderful thing. Good for you, and a good day to all. Thank you, Tom, and good luck to all uh, marathoners on Monday. A special shout out to my dad, who many of you know, George O'Malley. He's turning 72 years old next week. He's also running the marathon on Monday to raise money for Dana Farber in honor of uh, his daughter, my sister, Jill. So congrats to all runners and, and uh, colleagues. If you please join me for a picture with Chaz, uh, that would be wonderful. So right up here, Chaz. Let's get mom and dad. Let's get mom and dad up here too. Right behind me.
Um, before we move on to the order of business, the second presentation, I've asked Councillor Braden um, to please, on behalf of this body, uh, offer a land acknowledgement. So Councillor Braden is going to join me up on the dais. Thank you, Council, um, Chairman, um, President, Matt. Matt. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, we may often overlook that this land was inhabited or is inhabited by Native Americans and indigenous, indigenous peoples for hundreds of generations before Europeans arrived on these shores. This is reflected in, the, in some of the place names that we use today that are also familiar to us, such as Massachusetts, Mattapan, Merrimack, Neponset, Shawmut. Out in Alston Brighton, we have Nonantum and Wabin. As we prepare to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Boston, may we be intentional in making a land acknowledgement to recognize Indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land. We also honor, honor the enduring relationships between Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories, despite painful histories of genocide and forced removal. This land acknowledgement is based on, the mod on and modified from the Uplander Project, Upstander Project, sorry, a Boston-based organization committed to challenging indifference to injustice by raising awareness and sharing resources to encourage upstanders, those who stand up, speak out, and take action against injustice. So we, uh, we acknowledge the sacred land where we work, live, learn, and build community has been a place where people have lived for over 13,000 years. This land is a traditional territory of, of the Massachusetts, Pawtucket, and their neighbor, neighbors, the Wampanoag, and the Mipnock peoples, who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. We recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty, territory, and water perpetrated by invaders who have impacted the original inhabitants of this land for over 400 years. We extend our respect to the citizens of these nations who live here today and their ancestors who have lived here for over 500 generations and to all indigenous peoples. We also infer, affirm that this acknowledgement is insufficient. It does not undo the harm that has been done and continues to be perpetrated now against indigenous people, their water and land. May we commit to learning from the traditions of traditional peoples and indigenous peoples. They, they have a long history of living in harmony with nature, sustainable existence and we have so much to learn as we face the challenges of climate change uh, from, from their traditions. And uh, I humbly acknowledge uh, this, this is a land acknowledgement that I offer today in recognition, recognition of that long history. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. All right. Um, Thank you again, Councillor Braden. And we are now on to the first order of the business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All of those in favor of approving the minutes at the last meeting, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Moving right along to communications from Her Honor, the Mayor. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 1036. Thank you. Docket 1036, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $239,254 in the form of a grant for the FY 2020 DNA Capacity Enhancement and Backlog Reduction Program awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund two criminalist positions over time lab supplies and continuing education expenses. Thank you, Docket 1036 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Madam Clerk, would you please read Docket 1037? 
Docket 1037, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $49,192 in the form of a grant for the FY22 Municipal Road Safety, awarded by the United States Department of Transportation, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund high visibility traffic enforcement of motor vehicle laws, including but not limited to speeding, aggressive driving, distracted driving, impaired driving, and occupant protection. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Andrea Campbell, chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Chair Campbell, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. At this time, as chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, seeking suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1037, it's pretty self-explanatory. We've actually received this in the past. If anything, the department would like more funds for this. Um, it really has to do with helping with traffic concerns, including, of course, enforcement of uh, motor vehicle laws, speeding, aggressive driving, distracted driving, and, and so much more. It's a relatively small, small grant, so we want to get it to the department as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Campbell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1037. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The order is passed. Moving on to reports of public officers and others. Madam Clerk, would you please read dockets 1038, th excuse me, 1038 through 1040 together. Thank you. Docket 1038 notices to see from the acting mayor of the appointment of Gregory Rooney as interim commissioner of property management effective September 27, 2021. Docket number 1039 notices to see from the acting mayor of the appointment of Bradley Garrett as interim commissioner of transportation and parking effective September 27, 2021. Docket number 1040, notices to see from the acting mayor of the appointment of Mata Rivera as interim commissioner of the Boston Centers for Youth and Families, effective September 30th, 2021. Uh, thank you, dockets 1038 through 1040 shall be placed on file. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 1041. Docket 1041, the constable bond of Aisha Miller has been duly approved and received from the collector treasurer. Chair recognizes Councilor Andrea Campbell, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Chair Campbell, the floor, excuse me, is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, seeking suspension of the rules and approval of this docket, docket 1041, under the usual terms and conditions. Thank you. Thank you. The Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, Andrea Campbell, seeks passage of docket 1041 under the usual terms and conditions. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is hereby passed under the usual terms and conditions. And before I leave this office, I hope to understand what that means. <laughs> uh, Manning, moving right along to docket 1042. <laughs> docket 1042, communication was received from Michael B. Hurley, Clerk of the Senate, regarding the special election to be held on Tuesday, January 11, 2022 to fill an existing vacancy in the 1st Suffolk and Middlesex Senatorial District caused by the resignation of Senator Joseph A. Bunkori. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1042 shall be placed <laughs> on file. Matters recently heard for possible action. Up next, Docket 0957. Docket 0957, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $254,194 in the form of a grant for the challenge grant awarded by the William T. Grant Foundation passed through Northeastern University to be administered by the Department of Youth and Employment. The grant will fund research for Northeastern University Dukaka Center for Urban and Regional Policy that inform the design of a more inclusive workforce development system for the youth of Boston. The chair recognizes Councilor Julia Mejia, chair of the Committee on Small Business and Workforce Development. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. On Monday, we held a hearing on docket 0957, during which we discussed a grant awarded to the City of Boston to be administered by the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment. We were joined by Rashad Cope, Director of YEE, along with my council colleagues, Councilor Bach and Flynn. During the hearing, we heard about how, we heard a lot of stuff, let me flip my page here. We heard um, the grant will be used to research ways to build equity in youth employment opportunities. In this grant, youth is defined as anyone between the ages of 14 to 24. 
We also learned that the director COPE will be working to ensure that there is feedback in real time from the young people participating in this research. Councillor Bach also advocated that these young people be paid for their role in this research project. Overall, this is a grant that is going towards a good purpose, and at this time, I move that we pass this order and accept the grant. Julia Mejia, Chair of the Council on Small Business and Workforce Development, uh, seeks passage of Docket 0957. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Madam Clerk, would you now please read Docket 0567. Docket 0567, Councillor Edwards offered the following order for hearing regarding biannual review of the Boston Employment Commission and Boston Residents Job Policy. Thank you. The Chair recognizes uh, Chair Lydia Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Councillor Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We had our biannual, um, our second hearing on the Boston Residence Job Policy as, as, uh, as is required by ordinance. It was a great hearing, honestly, uh, for many reasons. One, we got some updates on the CSL course and additional pipelines that the city is trying to make. We also heard that they are finally moved um, formally all of their enforcement to Salesforce, which makes for real-time enforcement of uh, folks who are violating the, the, the ordinance or construction companies. I want to thank Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden, and Councillor Flaherty for attending um, the, the hearing to really kind of, again, direct where our concerns are. I also wanted to just use this moment now um, to really thank um, Chair of the Beck, um, Travis Watson, who came, and I think gave some of the most powerful testimony, specifically walking us through the history, how we got to where we are, and where we still need to go. Um, he is no, he is leaving his his position as the chair of the of the commission, and uh, he will be sorely missed. Um, he did leave us all with a message, however, uh, that is, as we go forward as a sit as a city, that he hopes that whoever is picked to replace him, that it's a woman that is a woman of color who's committed to racial equity and also able to build within the jobs um, within the jobs coalition. We also thank the Boston Jobs Coalition again for coming to testify and echo that history. So um, it was a great hearing. The next one will be in April, and uh, that's uh, it will, I ask that it stay in committee, and we'll continue on with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Lydia Edwards, uh, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, requests that Docket 567 remains in her committee. Madam Clerk, would you now please read Docket 0685. Docket 0685, Councillors Bach and O'Malley offer the following order regarding a text amendment to the Boston Zoning Code with respect to parking minimums for affordable housing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair now recognizes Councillor Lydia Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Chair Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I want to thank the co-sponsors for being there yesterday, especially the lead sponsor and who was able to help conduct the hearing on my behalf. I unfortunately had a conflict and couldn't uh, be there. That being said, um, I am going to turn it shortly over to uh, one of the sponsors, Councillor Bach, but in, in short, we're going to keep it in committee to continue to work on some certain issues, but we hope to move on this shortly. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the uh, lead sponsor of Docket 0685 uh, and the chair pro tempore of the Government Operations Committee yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Councillor Kenzie Bach, the floor is yours. A tempore which has now passed. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. President. Um, uh, yeah, I want to thank Councillor Edwards. Um, uh, her staff was instrumental in the hearing yesterday, uh, although I was holding the gavel. It was a great hearing. Thank you so much to the colleagues who came, in addition to yourself, Mr. President. Um, Councillors Mejia, Arroyo, Braden, um, Flynn, and we had letters from uh, Councillor Rue and, of course, Councillor Edwards. Um, it was very productive. We had DND and the BPDA and BTD there. Um, we had some uh, technical changes to the amendment language that had come from the DND feedback at the last working session. Um, but in many ways, the focus yesterday was on the hearing element um, and really had very powerful testimony from um, the folks, particularly members of Mass Senior Action, um, but also from Action for Equity, Transit Matters, um, Livable Streets, uh, Fenway CDC, um, and a number of members of the public. So it was a really great conversation. Um, we have a couple of uh, outstanding questions and the BPDA is checking on a technical thing that we've listed all the right um, zoning districts. So as the chair said, I'm looking forward to partnering with her to having this out on the floor for a vote soon, but um, but not today. So thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, Docket 0685 shall uh, remain in the Committee on Government Operations. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket 
1043. Councillor Edwards offered the following. An ordinance amending the City of Boston Code, Chapter 24, Boston Jobs and Living Wage Ordinance. Chair now recognizes the District Council from East Boston. Uh, Councillor Lydia Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'd first like to move to add Councillor Mejia as a co-sponsor. She is hereby added. Thank you very much. This is uh, following up on, a, I think, a continued conversation. Uh, we know as a city we have to lead when it comes to living wages and when it comes to people who are getting our city dollars, whether as contractors or subcontractors. Um, and we specifically need to remember all of the workers, including our custodial, custodial staff and building security, service workers, to assure that they're paid the prevailing wage as well. Uh, we have to continue also to up, update and continue to move in the city of Boston as we're looking at our jobs and living wage ordinance. So um, this is really just making sure it's expanded to all contracts and subcontracts, our prevailing wage standards. Uh, this was not, this is not new. Again, this was introduced actually, um, it was filed on July 10th, 2018 by the Walsh administration, but was withdrawn. And then the Janey administration did uh, an executive order on June 10th of 2021 and set forth a prevailing wage for custodial and security wages in contract services. Um, however, as an executive order, it may, we want to make sure that it is, it, we need to codify it to make sure that it is lasting and forever and continues. So this is what this does. This is a codification of the executive order and of the originally filed um, ordinance in 2018 to make sure that we codify living wages for our custodial staff as well as our security service workers. Um, this is, uh, I want to thank 32BGA, SEIU 32BGA for their leadership in this and they're pushing to make sure that we remember all workers and we're going to talk about city wages. So this is exciting. I think this is um, consistent. It is not um, at all, I honestly don't think it's really controversial. It's just bringing those workers into the same standards we hold for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester, Councilor Julia Mejia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councillor Edwards for adding me as an original co-sponsor. As the chair of the Committee of Workforce Development, it is crucial that we expand the living wage ordinance so that as many people as possible have strong job protections in place. This, is, this absolutely needs to include our custodial and security staff members contracted and subcontracted throughout the city. This issue is personal and professional for me as many of you know, I grew up cleaning offices across the city with my mom to make ends meet. The kinds of jobs we're talking about in this ordinance are the ones that are often taken up by immigrants and undocumented people throughout the city of Boston, people who are some of the least protected by our system. If we had a living wage and prevailing wage ordinance back when I was um, spending my nights cleaning offices, um, I would probably be better off today. We are incredibly lucky to have the city of Boston um, to have so many advocates pushing for us to redefine what a living wage looks like. The Boston Jobs Coalition has been working with our office for months to find new ways to expand the protections offered under the living wage ordinance. They are continuing the work of the late Chuck Turner, whose work um, to uplift working class people across the city continues to inspire me. We have a lot of work to do to continue his work, and we see this as an opportunity to do just that. Thank you so very much, and I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Would anyone else wish to speak on docket 0143? Seeing no takers, would any councillors wish to add their name as a co-sponsor? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Saiby George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn. You're already added, Councillor uh, Mejia. Please add the chair. Please add Councillor Wu. And docket 1043 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Now I'd like to invite uh, Councillor Braden to please take over the rostrum. Madam Clerk, uh, please read docket number um, 1044, please. Thank you. Docket 1044. Councilors Flynn and O'Malley offer the following order for hearing to discuss investments in electric vehicle charging infrastructure and electrifying the City of Boston's vehicle fleet. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you Madam President. Um, 
Thank you for Councilor O'Malley for partnering with me on this important um, hearing, hearing order. Councilor O'Malley and Mayor Janey and Mayor Walsh just finished the um, Birdo 2.0, and I know the city and residents are better off for that, that strong leadership. This is, this is about the electric cars coming into, into Boston. We have the potential Ford and GM are announcing that 40% of cars over the next 15 to 20 years will be electric vehicles. The Biden administration has proposed $8 billion in infrastructure improvements for electrical, electric vehicle uh, charging station um, throughout the country. Additionally, they're also offering a $12,000 tax credit for people that buy an electric vehicle. That's where our city is headed. That's where our, our country is headed. And it's a tremendous way for us to make sure that our cities and towns and communities across the country are safe and healthy for all residents. We have had major pollution, air pollution, throughout, throughout the history of our city. In my neighborhood in South Boston, certainly the Boston Edison has been a major, major polluter in the, in the city and in the region. South Boston had the highest rate of lupus, scoloderma, and other types of cancers, especially um, impacting women. My father's aunt lived on Arcadia Street, and when you would put the sheets out to dry, you would wake up the next morning and you'd see the, the beautiful white sheets would be turned completely brown. Uh, from the sh smut that was coming from the Boston Edison plant. Council Flaherty knows this issue very well as well. Um, the other issue I wanted to highlight was in Chinatown, this neighborhood has the highest rate of asthma of any neighborhood literally in the country. It's located, as you all know, next to 90 Freight. It's located right underneath the uh, Mass Pike. It's located just a short walk from the Amtrak station, from the bus station and the buses. Those, it, those, that pollution continues all night. Um, so what we're trying to do is to make the, the city cleaner and healthier and having a robust discussion on what the city possibly can do to improve infrastructure for electric vehicle charging station would go a long way to protecting our environment, protecting our health, providing our children with a better and healthier environment to live, to work, and to, and to play. So I'm proud to partner with Councilor O'Malley, who's done a tremendous job as a city councilor working on environmental issues. And um, <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge my staff that have helped me um, write this this uh, proposal as well. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. The chair now recognises the co-sponsor, President O'Malley. President O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. If you could just press my microphone. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I obviously, want to begin by thanking Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Flynn and his team. Uh, did all the work going into this resolution. They were kind enough to ask me to partner, um, and I'm just incredibly delighted and grateful for this opportunity because, as was noted in the President's Infrastructure Bill, which I am very hopeful will pass and will pass soon, we're looking at close to $8 billion that's going to go down to our cities and to our states to build this renewable, renewable infrastructure. Now, I'm old enough to remember when you couldn't find any EV charging stations, and then I think three showed up or four showed up on Cambridge Street, uh, and it was a godsend. And, I, and I, know, I know at least a quarter of this body owns and drives electric vehicles. Um, it's, it's what's needed, and we need to encourage opportunities for more folks to buy them. What's the one expression, and I, I know there are a lot of them that I, I'm, I'm like a broken record repeating, but every fiscal conservative ought to be an environmentalist because my Chevy Bolts through state rebates cost a heck of a lot less than a car that cost a lot, uh, had a smaller t sticker price. Obviously, I don't pay for gas. I don't pay for uh, a lot of the maintenance and wear and tear. And electricity, because of Community Choice Energy, is actually cheaper in Boston than it was a year ago. So it makes financial sense to invest in this. 
It is obviously important to protect our planet to invest in this, and this is great leadership that I know Councillor Flynn and many of you will be continuing in the uh, next year, um, but it's really important that the city has this conversation now and works with the next administration to make sure that we can access those funds to build this out. The number one uh, prohibition for an individual for buying an electric car isn't the cost, because again, there's state rebates that will save you money. You're gonna pay a lot less for an electric car now than you would for a similarly priced car, or even a, less expen a, less, a more expensive car. You're gonna pay less for, I think I may have got that wrong. Um, but there's also sort of, the, you know, many of us don't have an opportunity to charge our, our uh, cars at home. So this is a huge opportunity, right for the planet, right for your wallet, it's the right thing to do. So thank you, Councillor Flynn, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councillor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the makers for this. I am one of the, one of the councillors who owns an electric vehicle, so uh, I was not necessarily surprised but disappointed that there isn't an electric charging station in all of High Park, all of Mattapan. Uh, I don't believe there's any in Rosendale either, but I might be wrong on that one. Uh, in terms of increasing the existing infrastructure, that's great, and I love that we're having that conversation. One of the things I hope we can also either tie onto this conversation or have a further conversation on is we have a school bus fleet that should be electrified. That's a, that's a possibility now. They make electric school buses. That's something that should be done. My father was on the council when uh, he was pushing vegetable oil vehicles uh, because that was a thing. Uh, and, you know, I think this is something folks don't recognize necessarily the impact that our busing infrastructure, our school buses, our MBTA buses, our city vehicle fleet, if we move that towards clean energy, what a difference that would make for air quality and air pollution. And so this is something that I hope to see us moving on as more of these things become available. Uh, and we have this, hopefully, uh, I share your optimism that we have an infrastructure bill that we can use specifically for this purpose, because this, this meets many, many goals that we have as a city uh, and as a country. So. Uh, thank you to the makers for doing this, uh, and hopefully we make some real strides on this. Thank you. So you'd like to be added as a... Yes, please. Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Uh, chair, please add my name as well. The chair recognizes Councillor Wu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please add my name as well. Um, I was, I'm glad Councillor Royal spoke because I was going to throw him under the electric uh, bus uh, because I, I wanted just to make two notes. One, that um, in addition to electrifying our vehicle fleet, we have to think about all the infrastructure impacts in terms of the way this building and all the, the parking and storage is wired. And so he has been, as, a, as an electric vehicle driver as well, he has been, I've been trying to fend off his entreaty to switch spots because I've one near the plug in the garage downstairs. Um, and the other point that I just want to make sure, if, if possible, for the sponsors to add to this is I'm hearing a lot from tenants in larger buildings that as new buildings are being built, the requirements now for just a small percentage of the spots to have capacity for charging um, is, is now not even enough. So it's time to update those as well. So thank you both for your leadership and really excited to see this move forward. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Councillor Royo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabe George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Wu, uh, and please add my name. Thank you. This docket uh, 1044 will be referred to the Committee on Environment, Resiliency and Parks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for taking over. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you now please read Docket 1045. Thank you. Docket 1045, Councillor Campbell offered the following order for hearing regarding emergency housing transfers for those facing community-based violence. The Chair now recognizes the District right. Councillor from um, <laughs> Mattapan, <laughs> Councillor Campbell, the floor is yours. I have a lovely supporter who's yelling out, Amen, and I said, Amen. Um, I don't know if we'll get to a hearing on this, but we'll, we'll certainly try, and if not, we will work with, of course, a new administration on continuing the pressing conversation on this very topic. I, I first want to thank Tina Cherry and her entire team at the Peace Institute for the work they do every single day 
to respond to incidents of violence, both fatal and non-fatal in the city of Boston, um, and particularly the extra step they go to make sure folks who are currently living in dangerous situations can find housing, um, whether in Boston or outside the city of Boston. They work, have worked with my office, I think everyone on the council, uh, the mayor's office, the DA, everyone. They often are the coordinator in trying to, to pull us all together to find folks emergency housing. I also want to give a shout out to the VIAP team at BMC and other organizations that do this work. What we have found is my team and I are often in these conversations doing our best to get families housed, but there's no process, there's no short-term solutions, there's no coordination, and there's no long-term solutions. I do want to applaud the acting mayor for funding that she put in from the COVID relief funding for this purpose. I think it's really important. Um, I also want to acknowledge the work of Chief Dillon and D&D &D for the coordination and the work they do along with the Housing Authority to make sure that there is emergency placement. But this is going to take a holistic approach working with our federal stakeholders, public housing, Massachusetts, because it's a regional issue, to make sure that there's always an inventory of places that folks can go who are in danger. But most importantly, folks who also come forward to report on crimes they see in their communities. They often need emergency housing placement too and struggle to find it. So I'm hoping that we can have this conversation um, before I wrap up. And if we can't for some reason, we'll definitely continue to work with the person who succeeds me and of course, um, the next administration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Campbell. Would anyone else wish to speak on docket 1045? The chair recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester. Councillor Mejia, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you. Mr. President, and thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, if I am lucky enough to continue to be here, I will be um, championing this work forward. I think it's really important when we think about um, community violence. We have also, through our office, have come in contact with folks who have lost their loved ones right in front of their homes and also feel traumatized by that. So some of it is housing to support folks who are afraid, but then there's also the family that um, seeks uh, refuge uh, so that they don't have to be right there at home, uh, be re-traumatized. And so we have helped several families throughout this year find temporary spaces, whether it be through working our networks, working, reaching out to folks who have homes outside of the city of Boston to help find places for people to go, even if it's just for a short term. So when I think about this emergency housing, I also just want to uplift the folks, um, the, the homicide victims who are left to feel um, and be re-traumatized. Um, so they, they also need a break and a space to, to go um, to get away. So happy to sign on, happy to carry on the work, and I'm here for all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please add Councilor Julia Mejia as a co-sponsor. Chair now recognizes the District Council from South Boston. Councilor Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, could you please add my name? And I just also want to thank Councilor Campbell for the important work that she's done uh, for many years on domestic violence. I worked closely with Councilor Campbell in, have, in coordinating a hearing at Northeastern with, um, on domestic violence, and it was really Councilor Campbell in her office working closely with Northeastern University domestic violence advocates across greater Boston, but being exposed and listening to um, people that were victims of domestic violence um, and services that are available. Um, you know, Councilor Campbell really provided exceptional leadership on this issue especially for our immigrant communities as well. So that's something I hope um, I'm going to continue as, as a district city councilor. But I just, I, I just want to thank Councilor Campbell for getting me exposed to that, to that issue and learning a lot from her. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Ed Flynn as a co-sponsor. Would anyone else wish to speak on docket 1045? Seeing no takers, would any councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sidby George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Mejia, please add the chair, Councillor Wu. And docket 1045 shall be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Madam Clerk, now please read docket 1046. 
Docket 1046, Councillor Campbell offered the following resolution to declare October as Cooperative Month in the City of Boston. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair now recognizes the District Council for Mattapan. Councillor Andrea Campbell, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. And um, I also want to thank, I always want to thank Ellie, my, my team, um, for coordinating the conversations around the previous uh, hearing order, but also this resolution. I have to give a big shout out to the Dorchester Food Co-op, uh, which I am a member and I think others on this body are as well. Um, and I also want to recognize why we are going, I'm going to seek suspension of the rules and passage of this docket to declare this month as uh, Food Co-op Month. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this is also Domestic Violence Month. Obviously various months show up um, around particular topics, so it'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, particularly given what Councillor Flynn just said. Um, the Dorchester Food Co-op has over a thousand member owners and I want to thank of course not only my colleagues who've supported those efforts over the years, it is a grassroots effort um, and it really is ahead of what frankly this city should be talking about in co-op models. Um, these are locally owned businesses of course run by people who come together to achieve shared goals and to really build community ownership um, and, and to help the community thrive around particular topics but owned by the community, centered in the community, and always for and by the people. And as the Dorchester Co-op joins members of the neighboring Food Co-op Association in this year's Co-op Month theme, which is Building Back for Impact, or Build Back for Impact, um, we have an opportunity to not only highlight these powerful co-ops and the work they're doing, um, but they're really going to have to take the lead, or the city, I should say, will have to take the lead in working in partnership with these co-ops. Um, they not only provide great sustainable food, of course, they provide jobs, economic opportunity, rate right in the community for folks who live in those communities. And so this is a step in a, uh, in a direction to lift up their work, but also to declare this month as co-op month in the city of Boston, and hopefully begin um, a deeper conversation with the city on how they can support these efforts, similar to New York City and other places that are actually pouring in dollars and investments into these efforts. So seeking suspension of the rules and passage of this docket. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, would any, uh, I see some lights raised. If you'd like to speak on this matter before we add our name before we vote, please uh, indicate by pressing your uh, call button. And the chair now recognizes the district council from Beacon Hill. Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley, um, and I want to thank Councillor Campbell uh, for introducing this today. Please add my name. Um, I, I think that sometimes, you know, these resolutions that we do can feel just symbolic, but I think that actually for cooperatives, which are like so critical to a healthy ecosystem um, in the city that actually, uh, you know, keeps money in our local communities, um, builds community wealth, for those to succeed, they actually really need the kind of recognition um, that this resolution brings and the, rest, the recognition that these are the types of businesses that we should be preferentially trying to um, work with. I know my office has uh, repeatedly written letters of recommendation and support for cooperative businesses, especially with the large university and hospital employers in my district. Um, and I think that uh, it's just, it's one of those things that um, unfortunately the kind of attitude towards cooperatives as being bespoke and inherently kind of a small corner of the economy limits them. Um, and there are other places in the world um, where uh, they've taken on a much larger share of uh, market and of the sort of like economic democracy space, um, including in Spain. And so I just think, uh, I think this is really important. And I also just wanna um, give a shout out to D&D uh, &D for all the work they've done are on the housing cooperative side, which obviously we sometimes talk about a little bit differently from business cooperatives, but it is that same idea um, of of sort of uh, economic democracy um, together and the, the new share loan fund that DND has just inked to help people who don't have as much means buy into a cooperative um, and, and have that housing stability uh, and the new module that they're teaching in the home ownership class on that, I think is another piece of the city recognizing co-ops um, and their importance uh, to the fabric. So I just uh, wanna commend them for that and thank Councillor Campbell for her leadership and please add my name. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Kenzie Bach to docket zero one, uh, excuse me, 1046. Any councillors looking to speak on it? Any councillors looking to add their name on it? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Saiby George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Mejia, please add the chair, and Councillor Wu. And uh, Councillor Andrea Campbell seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 1046. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is hereby passed, or adopted, I should say. 
Um, moving right along to personnel orders. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 1047. Docket 1047, Council O'Malley for Councilor Campbell. Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1047. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Docket, docket 1048, sorry. Sorry, this is my, my fault. <laughs> docket 1048, Councilor O'Malley for Councilor Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1048. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We are now moving on to late files. I'm informed by the clerk that there are four late file matters. Uh, three of them are personnel orders, and one is a resolution from Councillor Mejia. So all those in favor of adding the four late file matters into the agenda, please indicate by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The late file matters are now properly before us and have been added to the agenda. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first late file personnel order into the record? Uh, in the City Council, October 6, 2021, Council O'Malley for Council Mejia. Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the first late file personnel order. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The order is passed. Madam Clerk, would you please read the second? In City Council, October 6, 2021, Council O'Malley for Council Mejia. Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the second late file personnel order. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The order is passed. Madam Clerk, please read the third late file personnel order. In City Council, October 6, 2021, Council O'Malley for Council Mejia. Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the third late file personnel order. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The order has passed. Now, Madam Clerk, would you please read the first and last uh, clause of the fourth late file matter? Oh, there's one more. Oh, I do apologize. I'm sorry. I think I had that wrong. There are, this is the fourth the personnel order, Madam Clerk, is that correct? That's and then correct. there will be a resolution. So I misspoke, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to object, you can, but I should have said there are five total late files, four are personnel, one is a resolution from Councilor Mejia. Is everyone, and everyone's good with that. We've just gone through the first three personnel orders. So this is the fourth late file personnel order. Madam Clerk, please proceed. In City Council on October 6, 2021, Council O'Malley for Council of Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the fourth late file personnel order. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The fourth late file personnel order has passed. So we, are, we have dispensed with personnel orders, Madam Clerk, correct? And we are now moving on to the resolution correct. that is properly before us. Would you please read the first and last clause of the uh, fifth late file matter, which is a resolution? Offered by City Councilor Julia Mejia in City Council, resolution opposing state receivership for Boston Public Schools. Whereas in February of 2020, the Department of Elementary and Secretary, Secondary Education, I'm sorry, uh, DESE, published a review finding that 34% of BPS school, 34 of BPS schools had student populations which scored in the lowest 10% of the state's MCAS standardization exam, which triggered fears that the state would push for receivership of Boston Public Schools. Um, therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council receives its strong opposition, voices its strong opposition to the possibility of state receivership of Boston Public Schools, and be it therefore resolved that the Boston City Council continues to work with Boston Public Schools, the Boston School Committee, Boston Teachers Union, and Boston Education Justice Alliance, and others, to ensure that our students are on the pathway to success. Filed in Council, October 6, 2021. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair now recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester Council. Julie Mejia, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm in competition with Council Edwards here with a late file. I have four today, girl. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. President, and to my colleagues for allowing me um, to hear this late file matter. We wouldn't be filing this late file if we believe the subject of state receivership wasn't urgent. In February of last year, DESE released a report finding that 34 of BPS schools had student populations which scored in the lowest 10% of the state's MCAS standardized exam. As soon as, as, as soon as that report was released, alarm bells went off in the heads of education and um, advocates across the city who were worried that this report 
would be used as a tool to implement state receivership over BPS. In response to this report, Superintendent Casilius worked to draft a MOU which established goals to get BPS where it needed to be. And while we're nowhere near where we need to be when it comes to tackling the achievement gaps in our schools, we are making progress. A state receivership would not only make it harder for parents, educators, and students to speak out, but it would fail to move us forward towards addressing the inequities of our academic system. How do we know this? Because we've seen it happen right here in Boston already. The state has taken receivership of the Dever and the Holland schools, and as a result, we have seen few improvements. Unchecked suspensions, a 50% decrease in Latinx teachers, and the destruction of the dual language program at the Dever. We have also seen few improvements to school districts under Desi's receivership, including Holyoke, Southbridge, and Lawrence. Compared to these schools, BPS scores higher in ELA and math on MCAS and has a higher teacher retention rate. It is clear from this data that a state receivership is not the answer to BPS's problem. And while we're not, and while we're not where we need to be, we are better off with local solutions. By centering the voices of the people who are closest to this issues, educators, students, and parents, as opposed to the state, we stand a much better chance of working towards academic equity. For those reasons, I'm really pushing that we move um, to suspend the rules and pass this resolution. And you know, I, I think what I find oftentimes is that we always place blame on teachers and parents and even students. But what we fail to do is put the blame where it belongs and oftentimes that's the system. The system is what is failing our students. And the state needs to take responsibility for that. And that is why I'm vocal vocalizing my strong opposition for state receivership here in the city of Boston, if that is even a threat. Um, so please join me in supporting this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Would anyone else wish to speak on this late file resolution? The chair recognizes the district council from Mattapan, Councilor uh, Andrea Campbell, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, and, and I, I do want to applaud uh, Councilor Mejia for the, for the resolution because I, in the past, have gone on record saying that I don't think state receivership is, is the way to go. But where I do agree with you is that we can't blame the teachers, we can't blame the families, we can't blame the parents. We can blame the state, I think, for many things, but we absolutely need to blame BPS. We absolutely need to blame the district. We absolutely need to blame elected officials. We need to uh, blame various facets of this local system that continue to fail, not only students and parents, but teachers and principals and others who work within the system as well. And I agree, we've made some, some progress, and I always want to give credit where credit's due. There are folks within BPS, including the district at the school level. My uh, four-year-old just started at the Kinney School. They're doing amazing work there on the ground um, with incredible leadership. So clearly there are folks in, within the system that are making improvements and making progress. But I want to be clear that this district is failing still so many, and many of the inequities within Boston Public Schools have actually gotten worse, not better. And probably worse since many of us were, some of us were students within BPS. I often recite living in Mattapan, the families have a 5% chance of getting into a high quality Boston Public School compared to some other neighborhoods in downtown in particular, 80% is their access rate. Nothing the district has done has changed that over the years. You look at the literacy rates at younger grade levels, they are still abysmal in many ways, particularly for our, our Latinx and black students. You look at the high school graduation rate, six out of 10 students for non-exam high schools will graduate. That is ridiculous when you think about all the resources and everything we have that we could bring to bear to change those graduation outcomes. In the MOU, there is still very little evidence from the superintendent and from the district that is being produced publicly that actually shows that they're meeting those benchmarks, including around facilities, um, including not just around facilities, but also around buses. And if you talk to my parents, for example, at the Sarah Greenwood School, they would probably say, we want a whole bunch of people to take over this district because they have repeatedly been on email chains day after day 
Many are just have thrown up their hands pushing for better infrastructure for that school, a swing space. And what they get repeatedly from the district is cancellations of the tours, cancellations of the meetings in which the district says we're going to show up and meet you where you are and actually provide some solutions. These parents are black and brown. They work really hard. They're taking time out of their busy schedules to advocate, and their advocacy is going absolutely nowhere. And so I do want to lift up all of those concerns, which we know hold back not just black and brown students, but every student. We lost 2,000 families within BPS, the sharpest decline in the last 15 years. These families are leaving because this system is failing them. The district has yet to do surveys to really prove that. They should. We've been pushing that. Many counselors have been pushing for that. And so I just want to stress that there's still incredible work to do. And if they don't get it right at some point, all of us might have to take over this district, frankly. But I look forward, of course, to working with the new administration, the current administration, and many others who are still in this system who want to bring about incredible change. Um, because if we don't, this is the main ship. And if it goes down, we're all in trouble. Thank you. You can add my name. Thank you, uh, Councilor Campbell. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Andrea Campbell's name. The chair now recognizes the district council from Dorchester. Councilor Frank Baker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do not wish to add my name. If this were in order for a hearing where we could have a discussion on what receivership means, I would definitely add my name. Because I'm not, similar to, to Councilor Campbell's um, comments, my children started in BPS 10 years ago, and I watched BPS in the last 10 years steadily go down. The school that they were in was a high-performing school. I don't say that with confidence today, that the same school that they were in in the first grade is a high-performing school here today. Um, the, the author talked about the state needing to take responsibility. This is what they're trying to do, take the schools over so they can take responsibility. Can't agree enough over here with, with the blame is on the bureaucrats. The blame is on the school committee and top down. The fish rots from the head down, Mr. President. Um, again, I think we should have a discussion about receivership and see where we are with rece receivership. One thing that I think that we could absolutely change if the schools did go to receivership, we could get rid of the, the busing contract and do that differently. We cannot, will not ever be able to even get into that contract unless the school goes into receivership. How much is it this year? 125 million. When I started, it was about 85 million. So that's five million a year, whatever the, whatever the numbers are. We're throwing bad money after bad money with just the busing. I went through the Deva school. I started my illustrious school. First year of busing was bussed over to the Deva, over to the Deva school. Um, and, and what happened over there? was bad because when it went into receivership, they were actually doing really, really good work over there. And the state did not give the school enough time to, to turn around. It was a three-year turnaround, and they were absolutely turning that boat around, but they didn't give them enough time. So again, I don't want to oppose receive, receivership. I want information on receivership. What does it look like? So again, if this were an order for a hearing and we were having a real discussion here so we could all throw opposing views in, not all the same view, and everybody says yes, I'm on board. I'm not on board for opposing receivership because I think we might, we probably should go into receivership. Another thing we might be able to do is, and I think should happen, mayoral candidates, please listen up. We should, we should take, um, hold on, draw a blank there, Madison Park and let Madison Park become their own, um, um, district, so they would have a Suffolk County, Suffolk County training school, like they do, like they do at Blue Hill, like they do in Worcester. Let them make their, their own choices out of there, away from the, the disaster that it is that is the school department, not teachers, not parents, not the people that are in the schools working, because we all know they're all pretty hard working and they want the best by their children. I think the failure is at the top. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh, chair recognizes the at-large council from South Boston. Councilor Michael Flaherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. The previous two speakers made some great points. True, the chair to the maker would the maker consider having a public hearing to get to the sort of the crux of uh, all the issues, what schools are performing well, which ones are not, what does receivership mean. At the end of the day, that uh, flashlight has been shown uh, on BPS, uh, and it's about time we get the superintendent in here to uh, do some explaining as to why these schools are chronically underperforming, uh, uh, particularly the ones that are under her watch. So again, through the chair to the maker, I think it would be great. It's a great suggestion by the previous speaker. Uh, why just sort of pass it off as a resolution. Let's have, 
let's have a hearing and let's bring everybody in and let's get to the bottom of this issue. At the end of the day, we have a responsibility, particularly parents, your primary responsibility is the education of your children. And if we continue to keep missing the mark, uh, school after school after school, year after year after year, that's a problem. And we need to address it. If the school committee is not going to address that up the street, we can address it right here in this chamber. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. So, uh, Councilor Mejia, you heard the query from Councilor Flaherty. I, I think the, the option, the question is, would you have a hearing? The other opportunity, if that's what you're interested in, is you could just not move for suspension of the rules. This would be referred to committee and we would have a hearing, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to answer that question, yes. for that request. Thank you, Mr. President, for the translation, too. I really do appreciate <laughs> it. Um, but I have to say is that, first of all, thank you to my colleagues. Um, I've been here for almost 19 months, and one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is the importance of relationships and identifying compromises and figuring out what's the best way to move forward and often recognizing that sometimes we need to get out of our, out of our own way for that work to happen. And I think I am so incredibly grateful for the feedback that we received right now, and I do agree. I think that the conversation needs to happen. It needs to be a public hearing. We need to bring everybody to the table, and we need to unpack this. Because like you, Councilor Campbell, I went to Boston Public Schools, and I now am a parent, a BPS parent. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done here, and we have to address what that is and what it's going to take in terms of the political will to ensure that our students have the type of quality education that we've been allegedly fighting for. So I wholeheartedly agree and appreciate um, Councillor Flaherty and Councillor Baker and Councillor Campbell's um, feedback because I do believe that I'm going to pull this out. It's not going to be a resolution and I'm going to file, refile it as a hearing order. Right? Well, you I'm going to need... pull it out, and then we're going to just have another conversation, yeah. and it's going to be a public hearing. We, so so j just through you, if it's, I think it's probably easier and cleaner. Yeah. I could just assign this to the Education Committee, so that means you wouldn't suspend rules and, and we wouldn't take action. That would give an opportunity for everyone to speak on it and add their name if they wished. That's right. And then the hearing would be um, on the resolution itself. So that's probably the cleanest way, if that's good with you. I'm going to agree with you, O'Malley. All right. <laughs> Whatever you say, let's go with that. Okay. Sounds good. It'll go to your committee, right? All right. So thank, thank you. you. So I just thank heard you. Councilor Flaherty say, please add his, Councilor Flaherty's name to that. Please add Councilor Edward. Oh, I'm going to start in alphabetical order. Please add Councilor Arroyo. Please add Councilor Bach. Please add Councilor Braden. Please add, Con you already added Councilor Campbell. Please add Councilor Edwards. Please add Councilor Saiby George. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flynn. Che we don't need to add you, Councilor Mayor. We already got you there. Please add the chair. Please add Councilor Wu. And the uh, fifth late file matter, which is the resolution on receivership, will be referred to the Committee on Education. So thank you, uh, thank you all. That was a good, good discussion on that. Um, would anybody now wish to remove an item? F oh, before I move to the green sheets, uh, Council Royal, for what reason does the gentleman stand? Uh, just a quick motion to reconsider, 1043. Uh, I think I missed adding my name. Okay. Councillor uh, Arroyo is moving for reconsideration of docket 1043. Any objections? Seeing none, he is hereby added as an original co or as a co sponsor on 1043. Thank you. Thank you. We're now moving on to the green sheets. Anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Seeing no takers, uh, we're now moving on to the consent agenda. We've, I've been informed by the clerk that we have one late file to the consent agenda, which is a resolution from Councillor Bach. Um, anyone object to adding Councillor Bach's late file to the consent agenda? Please indicate. Or is all in favor of adding Councilor Buck's late file uh, to the consent agenda, please indicate by saying aye. <laughs> Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The late file is at hereby added. The chair now moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The consent agenda has hereby been adopted. Does any councillor wish to make an announcement at this time? The chair recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester. Councillor Anissa Saiby george the floor is yours. Thank you very uh, much, Mr. President. I rise today, as it happens on occasion, that a birthday lands on uh, council meeting day. So I'd like to wish Douglas a very happy, it's horrifying to even say it out loud, 17th birthday. But happy birthday, Douglas, or as your friends like to call you, Dougie, um, on your 17th birthday. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy birthday, Douglas. We can give a round of applause. Any other announcements from colleagues? The chair recognizes the district councilor from Beacon Hill. Councilor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Um, 
because we uh, are not having a meeting next week, I just wanted to say, <laughs> go Red Sox! <laughs> The District Council from Fenway Park, uh, thank you for that. Uh, finally, I would like to add um, that today is the 2021 Henry L. Shattuck Public Service Awards, and in pre-COVID times, we would typically hold an event. It was really one of my favorite meetings of the year, so for you uh, freshmen, I, I hopefully we'll get back to it next year, but we'd have all the Shattuck awardees with a little reception before the council meeting. Um, it is obviously, for safety reasons, being held virtually, but I did want to take a moment to congratulate our public service leaders who have gone above and beyond to serve this city exceptionally well, particularly during this incredibly difficult time. And I want to begin by congratulating the senior administrative assistant at the clerk's office, our own Trish Finnegan. Congratulations, Trish. We love Trish. It is so well deserved, Trish. You are the, just the, the you know the, the, the pinnacle of professionalism. You get things turned around. You work so well with with Clark Feeney and Assistant Clark Jurantis, and obviously all of your colleagues who love you so well, which is why they're here. Um, so congratulations to you. Um, also wanted to acknowledge the other awardees: Manny Lopes, who is the President and CEO of East Boston Neighborhood Health Center; Colette Phillips, the President and CEO of Colette Phillips Communications Incorporated; uh, Maravel Crespo, Detective for the Boston Police Department. Richard DePiano, De, DePiano, who's the assistant, uh, second assistant collector, treasurer at the Treasury Department. Uh, Shakima Dockery, operations manager at the Mayor's Office of Economic Development. Stephanie Haynes, I will miss not uh, receiving emails from Stephanie Haynes uh, every week, who's the administrative secretary at the ZBA. Rebecca Fu, director of operations and licensing at Licensing and Consumer Affairs. Della Vern, Stanislaus, Director of Transportation at BPS, and Brad Swing, who is the Director of Energy Policy and Program at EEOS. A round of applause for all of the incredible awardees. <laughs> congrats, Trish. We're now moving on to memorials. Um, today we're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. If you uh, would be so kind, if you're able, please rise. We'll wait for the clerk's office to... Uh, leave. They're busy at work. <laughs> okay. Today we're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councillor Baker, Chrissy Dinsmore and Funky Moy. For Councillors Flynn, Flaherty and Baker, Anne Marie Collins, Elizabeth Ann Hogan and Patricia Patsy A. Joyce. For Councillor Flynn, Wong Lan Haygoon. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We are scheduled to meet again, not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, October 20th at 12 noon in the Christopher Ionella Chamber. All in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it, the council is hereby adjourned. Thank you.